All right, so we're going to take a brief look at um, our states of matter and the changes in between the different states, our phase changes. So we'll look at a couple graphs, we'll look at a couple um, examples of some calculations involved in this, like with heat of fusion, heat of vaporization. And we're pretty much going to stick with solids, liquids, and gases. Yes, there's Bose-Einstein condensates, which are at temperatures even below solids. And yes, we have ga uh, plasmas, which are at temperatures above gases. But um, that's not going to be our focus. Here's a fun little look at a different view of solids, liquids, and gases. I know. Funny, funny, funny. All right. This little diagram explains to us or refreshes our memory about all the different phase changes. If we're going to go from solid to liquid, that's called melting, or it's also referred to as fusion. I know I hate that word too, because that makes me think of putting things together, but it's okay. That's what they say. Um, if I go from a liquid to a gas, vaporization. Of course, if it's at a certain temperature, that would be called boiling. And if it's below that temperature, then it's what we call evaporation. You probably remember those terms. Reverse processes from gas to liquid, we call that condensation. You might also see this word called liquefaction. If a substance is normally gas at normal conditions, like room temperature, standard temperature and pressure, and that gets put into a liquid, then we call it liquefaction. Okay, yes, it's still called condensing but it's just another term that you might see, so I wanted to point that out there. So like oxygen, which is a gas at room temperature and pressure, when we liquefy that, it's called liquefaction. All right. And then from liquid to solid, of course, is freezing. Then we have the ones that aren't talked about as much, from solid directly to a gas, that's called sublimation. Um, mothballs, they are these little, uh, spherical things that people used to put into their wool clothes to prevent moths from eating them in the summer. Um, dry ice, of course, sublimates from directly from a solid to a gas. This process is used a lot with freeze-dried food. Not as popular as it used to be, but still, like instant coffee, you make the coffee and then you freeze-dry it. You get rid of all the water by having it sublimate out, and then all you have to do is add water back and it reconstitute to coffee. Hooray! Um, the reverse of that, gas to solid, is called deposition. All right, you can also just call it um, condensing, but deposition is the word that we say from gas to solid. Like frost, okay, if we have, there's water vapor in the atmosphere and during the day perhaps some of the snow on the ground will evaporate and so the air has water vapor in it and then when it gets cold at night if that water vapor hits your car or hits a window and instantly turns into solid so it goes directly from gas to solid all right so that sums up all of our different phase changes of course if we are going to the right if we are absorbing heat then that would be an endothermic phase change and if we're going to the left we are releasing heat that would be exothermic phase changes. Now here's this lovely graph. We looked at this graph during the gas section as well. And what this is, it's that Bozeman graph. And it shows us the ranges of kinetic energies of particles. And so when you're at a colder temperature, at a lower temperature you see here. Come on, please cooperate. Oh, sorry, hold on. So you see again, at a lower temperature, we have many more of the particles in the same kinetic energy range. And then at a warmer temperature, we have a much more dispersed temperature range. Okay, and why this is really important is because of what's going on here on the right-hand side. What this is looking at are the distribution of kinetic energy of particles in a liquid. All right, And once these liquid particles have enough energy, then they can escape. They can vaporize. And so you see a lower temperature, there are less particles that have the kinetic energy necessary to escape. 
But at higher temperatures, there are many more of those particles that can escape. It makes sense, okay? Water at a warmer temperature will have, will have a faster evaporation rate than water at a colder temperature. Now, if we would seal a liquid in a container, then you would have some of those liquid particles escaping to become a vapor. And then eventually you would reach a dynamic equilibrium and you would have the same amount of vapor particles and the same amount of liquid. And it's dynamic because as every, every once in a while when a particle would evaporate, you would also at the same time get a particle to go back and condense. But you set up this dynamic equilibrium and you can measure what's called a vapor pressure, the pressure of the vapor above the liquid. And so you see our graph here, as the temperature is increasing, so does the vapor pressure. You see all the curves going upward. And a liquid that is said to be volatile, that means that it has a higher vapor pressure. It evaporates more fast. More faster? Faster. Faster. <laughs> Sorry. And a lot of volatile liquids have some very distinct odors, like gasoline or paint thinners, stuff like that, ethers, alcohols. Now, the point right here you see, when a liquid's vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, so you can see on this graph 760 torr, or millimeters of mercury, then that is the boiling point of that liquid. And there you see 100 degrees Celsius for water. So again, when the vapor pressure of a liquid equals the atmospheric pressure pushing down on it, then you have free exchange of the vapor particles. It starts to boil. All right, so the lower the vapor pressure, the lower the boiling point. Um, if, like, for example, water, if you try to boil water in Denver, Denver, Colorado is the mile high city. There's less atmospheric pressure pushing down on it. And so therefore the boiling point of water is lower in Denver than places like where we are in, in Ohio, where the atmospheric pressure is closer to sea level pressure. Evaporation, vaporizing, boiling, it's a cooling process. Why? Because as this happens, the high energy particles are leaving. So when they leave the liquid, they are leave the lower energy particles back behind. And so this is what's happening like when we sweat. Liquid is coating our skin, it evaporates, and all the takes the heat with it and cools our skin down. And this is something we saw in our intermolecular forces lab when we were measuring the temperature change as different solutions, different liquids were evaporating. This is a heating curve, very, very common. Okay, so again, as heat is added, as you move to the right, the temperature is increasing. And so you see solid starts getting warmer until you hit this, this spot, which would be the melting point. And again, very important, during a phase change, our temperature is not changing. All the kinetic energy that is being added to the substance is changing the phase. And then you start, once you're completely melted, you start heating up the liquid until you get to this point, which would be the boiling point. And again, you see the phase change, and then once all the liquid has changed to a gas, then the gas would start heating up in temperature. If you go the opposite way, if we have a gas and it cools down, then right here you would hit the condensing point. The phase would change, turn totally to liquid, the liquid would cool down, and you would hit the freezing point. And then the phase change would happen totally as solid, solid gets colder. Here is the heating curve for water, okay, one mole of water, and you can see we've got some numbers on here now, temperature, and we've got some enthalpy changes. And again, you'll see here, right here is the phase change between solid and liquid, okay, melting, freezing, and here is our condensing and vaporizing. Notice the huge difference between those two plateaus, all right, over here with melting, freezing, that is called the heat of fusion. The heat of fusion for water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. 
Over here, we see the heat of vaporization, 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay, why is that number so incredibly different? Again, remember to vaporize, you must break the intermolecular forces that are holding particles together. All right, so you physically have to separate particles so that when they become a gas, they are independently moving particles. When you're melting, you're just simply breaking the, the crystalline structure down. And there's still intermolecular forces holding the particles together in the liquid phase. So that question comes up quite often. And the higher the intermolecular forces, which we'll talk about a bunch, then the higher that heat of vaporization will be. Here is a phase diagram. And here you see all the states of matter and all the different pressure and temperature conditions that a substance could be at the different states of matter. Okay, so this substance, for example, is a solid at all these different temperatures and pressures. All right, and then liquid over here, gas over here. And then you can see some important points on here. This is called the triple point, and that is a point where all three states of matter exist at the same time. Below the triple point, you can see that's where sublimation would occur, going directly from a solid to a gas. And then up here is what's going to be called the critical point, because a fun little thing happens. Once a substance gets to a certain temperature and pressure, it becomes a supercritical fluid. There is no longer a definitive boundary between the liquid state and the gaseous state. Okay, for example, here we see the separate phases of carbon dioxide. You can see a meniscus clearly dividing the vapor and liquid stages, phases. As the temperature increases, the meniscus starts to diminish. Blurred lines. Thank you, Robin Thicke. Increasing the temperature further causes the gas and liquid densities to become more similar. The meniscus is less easily observed, but you can still kind of see it. And then all of a sudden, ta-da, once the critical temperature and pressure have been reached, the two distinct phases are no longer visible, and we have the supercritical fluid. Of course, as our book pointed out, um, this is a fantastic solvent, so we're looking to use supercritical carbon dioxide to do a lot more things that some pretty serious organic solvents had to do in the past. So they are important. All right, let's just look at a couple little sample problems that I gave you. Here you see liquid butane used in lighters. You've got 39.3 grams of this liquid butane gas removed. How much heat must be provided to vaporize this gas? It's just a simple stoichiometry problem because you see a nice little conversion factor right here, 21.3 kilojoules per mole. So I can see that I'm going to need to start with my grams of butane, change that to moles with the molar mass, and then use that heat of vaporization, kilojoules per mole, and you see that it's 14.4 kilojoules. All right, a very similar question. This time it's ammonia. Ammonia has a heat of vaporization, 23.4 kilojoules per mole. That means it has stronger intermolecular forces than the butane because of its higher heat of vaporization. So how much heat is required to vaporize 775 grams of ammonia? Same problem, just different numbers. Okay, molar mass of ammonia, use the heat of vaporization. This time with a much larger sample, we see a much larger amount of heat, 1,070 kilojoules. Now the interesting part of this, how many grams of water could be frozen to ice by the evaporation of this amount of ammonia? And what we need to know is that we have our heat of fusion of water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. So we just do this problem backwards. We know that we have 1,070 kilojoules. I use the heat of fusion of water to change that to moles. I use the molar mass of water. And that means 3,200 grams of water could actually fuse, become a solid, um, frozen to ice at this with that amount of heat. All right, sorry. I'm running out of time on this video. I hope this helps a lot, though. It's just a nice review of states of matter and phase changes. And I'll catch you later.